All right, section 2.6, marginals and differentials. And if the word differential looks familiar, it's because we get that from derivatives. So <clears throat> you'll see how that corresponds to um, how we find a differential. Our objectives, finding marginal cost, revenue, and profit. Finding, and that little triangle is actually called delta. It's delta y and then dy. And then using differentials for approxim approximations. So the vocabulary, we've got to talk about what marginal cost, marginal revenue, and marginal profit are. The differential, which is dx or dy. And then delta notation, which I just said, delta x and delta y, and what they actually mean. Okay. <clears throat> There's a lot of concept here for a process which really isn't very difficult, but the concept is probably the most important thing so you actually understand what's going on. Although if you're just uh, like, you know, give it to me and let me see if I can do it. The process, I mean, the actual, the work is not very difficult here. All right. The main idea of, the, um, of this section is simple. The tangent line function, um, the tangent line, excuse me, to a function at a point is sometimes what's called a linear approximation. And the reason for that is because a tangent line itself is straight. It's just a line. So if you use the tangent line to approximate the actual function's value on a curve, um, then you're actually going to be using a linear approximation. There's a lot more I could go into much more in depth here to explain all that, but we're going to keep it, try to keep it relatively simple. So since straight lines are generally pretty easy to work with, because you can easily manipulate a line or plug things into the equation of a line pretty easily, um, you can use those to approximate things when you have something which is close to where the tangent line hits on the curve. For example, let me kind of um, show you right here. This right here would be a known value on the curve at x equals 3 because that's where the tangent line hits the curve. But if we're trying to approximate f of 4, the actual value of f of 4 is right here. But if we use the tangent line instead, the tangent line value is here. What you can see is the tangent line value would be slightly more than the actual value on the curve. <clears throat> and you might ask yourself, why would I do that if I know the curve? Well, maybe you don't know the curve. Maybe there's some other reason. And as a matter of fact, in our applications in real life situations, a lot of times things don't fit perfect functions, so we have to use the best approximation that we can. And the idea here is that the difference here, the difference between these two things is pretty small. Now what you can see is the further and further that tangent line goes from the curve to the right, the more and more this distance you know, gets bigger. That's going to get bigger and then it's going to get bigger here. And so you want to keep it as close to the known place where the curve hits the tangent line as possible. Something which would be maybe in this range, those would be really, really close approximations, don't you think? And you can hardly see the difference there between the lines. That's the general idea here. <clears throat> so the graph above illustrates estimating the value of the function at x equals 4. This is all what I just said. And the further and further you get away from 3, you can see that the um, tangent line approximation is going to be less of a good approximation as it would be the closer you are to 3. In particular, we often wish to build a function estimating, for example, how much it would cost to produce just one more item, or the x plus first item. So if you have x items, the x plus first item would be just one more item attached to it. Recall that the slope of a line represents how much the y value changes when the x value increases by 1. So now you can see why we would talk about the x plus first item. So the slope of the tangent line, or the derivative, is used in this context. So now let's go through the definition here. It's really pretty simple, pretty straightforward. C of x, R and x, and P of x are gonna uh, represent cost, um, revenue, and profit respectively. So the marginal, this is actually a really simple concept, the marginal cost, <clears throat> well, if you were to take the derivative, the derivative would really be the next cost so the next item's cost minus the current item's cost. Or if you were to rewrite that and solve for C of X plus 1, that means I would add the C of X to both sides. So you would get the cost of the item at whatever the value is plus the derivative 
at whatever the value is. So in other words, just for a quick example, if I wanted to find the cost of the 101st item, well, that means I would take the cost of the 100th item plus the derivative at the 100th item and add those together, and that would be the approximate cost of the 101st item. That's a marginal. You're just using the derivative, and you're going to add that rate of change to the current cost of however many items you have. Okay, marginal revenue, marginal profit work the same exact way. You're going to take the revenue for the next item, and it's going to be the revenue of the current item plus the derivative at the current item, profit exactly the same way. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Refer back to this if you need to. Let's go ahead and do an example. So in example one, we're given the cost is 62x squared plus 27,500. The revenue is x cubed minus 12x squared plus 40x plus 10. We wanna find the total profit. That's easy, we've done that before. That's just revenue minus cost. So our profit is going to be the revenue x cubed minus 12x squared plus 40x plus 10 minus the cost 62x squared plus 27,500. Let's make that squared actually look like a squared. There we go. And then let's go ahead and simplify that. That's going to be x cubed, let's see, negative 12x squared minus 62x squared is minus 74x squared. Um, and I've got plus 40x. And then 10 minus 27,500 is going to be minus 26,490. That looks right. Okay. <clears throat> so the total cost, the total revenue, and profit from the production of sales at 50 units. Let's find those. So we want to find the total cost of 50 units. So cost at 50 units is going to be 62 times 50 squared plus 27,500. <clears throat> Go ahead and plug that in your calculator and we're going to get 182,500, if I plug that in correctly. Okay, we want to find the revenue at 50, <clears throat> 50 units. So that's going to be 50 cubed minus 12 times 50 squared plus 40 times 50 plus 10. And that's going to give us, let's see if I plug that in correctly, $97,010. $97,010. Yep, that looks right. So our profit at 50, now you could go ahead and plug in the 50 into your profit equation, or since we've already done the cost and the revenue, we can just subtract those. So we know it's revenue minus cost. And unfortunately, our profit is negative here. So negative, looks like I'm going to get 85,490. I think if I plug that in right, 85,490. <clears throat> so we have a negative profit at 50 units. Obviously, we're going to need to sell way more than 50 units to make your profit here. <clears throat> now let's find the marginals. Well, again, the marginals are just going to be the derivative of <clears throat> each one of those functions evaluated at 50 units plus the original cost or the original revenue, original profit at 50 units. So my marginal cost... First of all, let's do C prime. So C prime, cost prime is going to be, what is that, 124x. We're going to need C prime at 50. 
So that's going to be 124 times 50, which is 6,200. So the marginal cost is going to be the cost at 50, which was 182,500 plus 6,200 dollars. That's going to be our marginal. <clears throat> so we'll say the marginal cost at 50 units is 182,500 plus 6,200. And let's see, what is that going to be? 188,000 700. Looks right. Let's see if something doesn't seem right about oh I know what it is. <clears throat> okay, I apologize. What I'm actually giving you here is the marginal cost of all 51 of them added together, not the marginal cost of the next item. The marginal cost of the next item is actually just this. Um, 6,200. Why is this not writing? Okay, I have to apologize. I know you guys won't be able to tell the difference there, but I had to pause this for a while. For whatever reason, my pen stopped working, so I went to recharge it, and I hope that's going to work. Um, so anyway, what I was trying to say, I think, is that this right here is the actual marginal cost. That's the cost that it would be for the next item. That's the derivative, um, and that's going to be what it would be for the next item. This right here would actually be the sum of all 51 items added up, not just the cost of the next item. So that is actually not what we're looking for. So let's just cross this off. This is what we were looking for. That's your marginal cost right there. All right, we should be able to finish this part off now. So the uh, marginal revenue R prime of X R prime of X there we go so let's see R prime of X is going to be 3x squared 3x squared minus 24x plus 40 and now if I want the marginal for selling 50 units that's going to be R prime of 50. So it'll be 3 times 50 squared minus 24 times 50 plus 40. And that's going to give us, let's see, this one I definitely have to plug into my calculator. That's going to give us 6,340. 6,000. 340 and then we need to do the marginal profit so p prime Let's see the profit was <coughs> x cubed so that's going to be 3x squared um, 74 times 2 is 148 so minus 148 x plus 40. Yep, that looks right. So we're going to plug in 50. And we get 3 times 50 squared minus 148 times 50 plus 40. So the marginal profit is going to be Looks like one hundred forty dollars. So the profit that we would get for selling just one more looks like it would increase by one hundred forty dollars. All right. So note the cost of the fifty first item. The actual cost of the fifty fifty first item is C of fifty one minus C of fifty, which is six thousand two hundred sixty two. What we got for an approximation was 6,200. So was it a good approximation? I'd say it was pretty close. We'll just say pretty close. 
Probably not as close as we'd really like to have it, but it was close. It was only off by 62, so not bad. Okay, so that's the idea of the marginal. Now we're going to talk about the idea of the differential and delta notation. So recall that the slope is often described as the change in y over the change in x. Well, the delta, the delta notation, which just kind of looks like a little triangle, is basically just the word for um, the change. So delta x literally means the change in the x values, or take the two x values and subtract them, x2 minus x1. That's the change in x. The change in y, likewise, is y2 minus y1. So if you've ever seen this before, you know that the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x, x1. Well, we can write that in shorthand as the change of y over the change of x. Okay, this represents the slope of the secant line. Remember, that's just an average slope. So for a very small change in x, we know that the slope of the secant approximately is equal to the slope of the tangent line. So for a very, very small change in x, delta y over delta x is equal to f prime of x. Or if we take this delta x and we multiply it to both sides, then you get that delta y equals f prime of x delta x. Okay, so the change in y is going to be approximately f prime of x delta x. Okay, so let's find delta y when y equals x squared and x equals 4 and delta x equals 0.1. So <clears throat> if we want to find the actual delta y, that means we need to find the actual change in x. Okay, so that's the actual, I'm sorry, the actual change in the y value. So we need to find the y value at the two different points. Well, they gave us one of those points, x equals 4. So let's find the y value at x equals 4. So when x equals 4, y is going to equal 4 squared, whoops, 4 squared, which is 16. Now we have to find the y value, so we'll call that one y, um, y1, no, yeah, y1. So y2 has to be at the second point. Well, they didn't give us a second point, but what they told us was that x changes by point 0.1. So if we start at 4 and x changes by point 0.1, the new um, x value is 4.1. So basically our x2 is 4.1. And then we have to do 4.1 squared. And 4.1 squared is 16.81. So now if I want to find delta y, delta y is defined to be y2 minus y1, which in this case is 16.81 minus 16, or just 0.81. That's delta y, given the fact that y equals x squared, x equals 4, and the change of x is 0.1. <clears throat> All right, so the definition here y equals f of x, we define dx, which is called the differential of x, by dx equals, and in this case, delta x. You're going to find this part interesting because dx and delta x are actually exactly the same thing. They actually mean the same thing. In this case, dy, however, is called the differential of y, and dy is actually going to be f prime of x dx. And really what that comes from is it comes from this. f prime of x equals dy over dx. They are the same thing, right? We use those interchangeably f prime of x and dy dx is both the derivative well if i just take the dx part and i multiply it over to here then what i have is dy equals f prime of x dx and when we're talking about differentials dx and delta x happen to be exactly the same thing the change of x doesn't change when you use the tangent line approximation for a differential okay so let's go ahead and do example three Consider the function given by y equals f of x equals square root of x. First, we want to find dy when x equals 9 and dx is 1. And then we want to compare that to the actual change delta y. So you'll see how close these two things can actually be. So first of all, let's find dy. Well, dy is defined to be f prime of x 
dx. So they told us dx is 1. That's nice. So we do have to find f prime of x. So we've got to take the derivative of square root of x, which is 1 half x to the negative 1 half, and then dx. So now what we have to do is we have to fill in the values. Well, we want to do this when x equals 9. So we're going to plug in 9 for x. So we're going to get 1 half 9 to the negative 1 half power times dx, which is 1. 9 to the negative 1 half. The 1 half power is a square root, so that's going to be 3. The negative puts it in the denominator. So really what we get here is 1 half times 1 third. That's from the 9 to the negative 1 half times 1. So what I get is a sixth. And um, we're probably going to want to put that in terms of a decimal just so we can see how close this is. 1 sixth in terms of a decimal is approximately equal to 0.1666, and it just keeps on going. The sixes repeat forever. So now let's compare that to the delta y, the actual change of y. Well, to do the actual change of y, let's see, we need to do y, y, y1, which is going to be plugging in 9 for x, so that's going to be the square root of 9, or 3. We need to do y2. Now it says here dx is 1, which means that the x is going to change by 1. So y2 is going to be now the square root of 10. And if you plug the square root of 10 into your calculator, um, you're going to end up with 3 point, let's see what it is, 3.16227 and so on. So we're just going to go 1623. One, <coughs> And then delta y is the subtraction of those two. So it's 3.1623 minus 3, which is going to be approximately equal to 0.1623. What you should see is that that number right there, our dy, is pretty close to our delta y. They're actually exact to two decimal places, and then they start to differ. So use the results in part A and part B to actually estimate the square root of 10. Well, we did kind of have to plug in the square root of 10 into the calculator. Um, but what we can do <coughs> is we can use the differential to actually approximate this. So if we use the differential, what we're going to get is that the square root of 10 is approximately equal to the square root of 9 plus the differential dy. So the square root of 10 is going to be approximately equal to 3 plus dy, which we found to be 0.1666. And so that's going to be approximately equal to 3.1666. And of course, we used the, the calculator to plug in the square root of 10 up here and got that. And then here was our approximation using the differential. Again, pretty close. It's off, it's off after the second decimal place. Not too bad of an approximation overall. All right, I think that's been plenty enough for one video. We'll uh, shut this video down. We'll come back and finish this in a second video.